Welcome back to Heart to Heart with me, Shakti Sundari. Today we're here at the Bali Spirit Festival and we're going to be speaking to Kachi Ananda who practices Dharma Yoga. So what was the theme of your workshop this morning? The theme today was how to do yoga with your innocent little creature body so that your yoga doesn't reflect your ambition but actually that you learn how to build an ally and a friend with your body rather than an enemy so that you learn how to listen and study and give your body what it actually needs which is usually a little bit of work, a little bit of playfulness, a little bit of attention, a little bit of love and then your body is actually your ally when you're going to do something in the world like whatever it is you want to do. You want to have a body that's right there on your side that's fit and works well and, and, and has stamina. That's why we do yoga. You used that phrase, the creature body, in the class when we spoke before. So is that your own catchphrase? Yes, it is. Body? It is. I, I don't know. I started it um, years ago. I was like this, you know, because today, like with the yoga, there's this kind of idea that the yoga has to, the, the the body has to be perfect like you see pictures of like flawless young women flexible with you know Absolutely. in the right light and it's, it's start starting to resemble more the model industry than yoga i mean you have a body you can do yoga basically and it's it's sad because a lot of people say oh i can't do yoga i'm like well you have a body you can breathe yes you can in my yoga you can come in whatever body you happen to have but today, like it's this stylizing of the body that it has to be a perfect body and that couldn't be further from the truth. And no matter how much uh, you do and how much you fast and how much you know, take pictures in the right light, your body will age sooner or later because your body isn't perfect. It's a creature body. Yeah. And so it's not the god or goddess. Like we have something divine that's in us, sure, but it's not the body. The body is just a little creature body and hopefully you can love it like you would love a dog or a companion animal but you you know little creatures right they are they have neurosis and they're weird and they're funny and you love them and that's what for me yoga is like the process of learning how to love your body just the way it is there's many people who will never be thin they don't have that kind of body or they will never be flexible and it isn't about that. Yoga should be for everybody because right. yoga is a way of being okay with who you are. Exactly. And you, okay, and you mentioned that in your class this morning and I was sort of thought, oh, I wish every teacher would say that. It's like yoga is not about how flexible you are. That's really not what it's about. Can you just give your definition of what oh, yoga is, please? Yes. <laughs> That it irritates the shit out of me. Like that, you know, yoga is about flexibility. Yeah. It's it's so not true. Like yeah. if you create a safety, if you create smart yoga, good frame, the flexibility will come. Your flexibility. For me, yoga, very easy translated, is skill in action. You learn to do something skillfully, and it's not just with your body. Like you do a pose and it hurts. Well, obviously you're not doing it skillfully. It doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. We all learn with mistakes, but it means, oh, there's maybe a better way to do it. And it's the same with the Dharma. The Dharma is like, well, is there a better way of doing this? Like if I have a, you know, a fight with my husband, is there a better way of communicating? Skill in action is how we, the yoga is there so we can live our values in the everyday life. It's not a separate thing. And at night you go to bed and you think, wow, I could have done that a little more skillfully. Okay, let me try again tomorrow. And that's the beauty of a practice that you don't necessarily do it yeah. right, but then you'll do it again the next day. So this separation that you've talked about, um, you know, like where people are pushing themselves and its body, and I see that myself as a teacher so often, people are pushing their bodies to something that isn't going to work for their bodies. It's painful and uncomfortable, but still there's this sense of I have to do this for some reason. Right. Why do you think that is? Why is this so much apart, so ingrained in all of us? That's such a good question. Well, one of the reasons is that in the West, we have what I call the not enough syndrome. We think it's never enough. We've been taught that somehow we're not enough. 
something about, you know, and you can like fill in the blank. Not thin enough, not rich enough, not good enough, not smart enough, not something enough. So we've been taught that the only, that this is the, the basically the um, result of a patriarchy. It's like, it's basically, it's never enough. You have to push for more. And so when we do, we're, when our mind is not trained, which most people don't have a trained mind, it just behaves like that. It thinks that it's going to be safe by getting more. So we push, and that's why we see the world in the state as it is. It's not bad people. It's just people not knowing what makes happy. And so practice is there that we can see that tendency of the mind to wanting to you know, get more or control things or push and to question it, say, well, is this really true? Will more money make me really happy? What do I actually want to do with the money? Maybe there's another way of materializing, of manifesting my dream that doesn't even need money. So it's that kind of questioning and kind of learning how to curb the mind. It's really true. Like we say in the Vipassana, it's like the mind makes a very bad master but it makes a good servant. Mm -hmm. So we learn actually what we're training is not so much the body. The body just needs to find its own expression again and its own free range of movement. That's it. That's all the body needs and feel good about itself. The mind needs to be trained and it gets trained by first paying attention what is. So like when you start seeing your crazy mind, like your mind always like the moment you see something like, oh, where did you get that? I need that too. And then you start questioning, well, do I really need that? And it's like, oh, well, maybe, maybe not, you know. And you make a decision based on a deeper, wiser part of you rather than just that, oh, I got to have this. So that's how we start in the yoga practice. But as a teacher, we need to basically talk about it. The mind will tend to push you. Don't listen to the mind. Listen to a deeper part. Is this fun? Are you having a good time? Do you feel in integrity? Listen to that part. And it's the, this is quite radical, though. Still, I think. I mean, you, I were, know. Ta you were talking about how in your, you've been practicing yoga for how many years now? Thirty years. Thirty years, and you've been teaching. Thirty years. But, yeah. So that's a long time. <laughs> it's a very long and time. You spoke in class this morning about how your teachers used to try and push your um, your knees down to open your hips. hips more and how that actually created damage oh yeah in your body yep yep still suffering today it created a lot it's it's just i think that yoga yoga needs to get out of the clutches of the patriarchy now right i agree simple <laughs> what does that actually mean like what does it mean when you say this for somebody who's watching this who might not understand what you yes mean? okay i i want to make sure that it's not about hating men yeah. A doll. I love men. I'm married to a really good man. Like my man is the best. I love males and the masculine principle. But I think a lot of the um, system, the way it has been, which has been in denial of the feminine or putting the feminine down, that has cr created damage for both men and female. Absolutely. And for me, it's kind of like that. So first has the mother principle has to be established in somebody and if you're lucky you get a teacher that has both the female and the male but first is the female that means there's a, a saying in the tantric lineage that says you can never fall below Kali that's the Tantra I love this it's like Kali no matter how deep you you fall from grace Kali will still be underneath you you can never fall. So it's like in Germany, it's a dark Madonna. It's this, yeah. you know, the mother love, like whether their her children deserves to be loved or not, it, the, the Kali doesn't care. She will love you no matter what. That's like, a, that's a ground. That's a ground. If we don't develop that ground, we will not develop healthily. Like the difference, for example, is like a man or a woman who hasn't developed that ground of the mother principle, mm -hmm. if they fail big, they will commit suicide. Right. We have seen that a lot. Right. But if you have that and you fail, you fall down and you're like, wow, that sucked. I failed. Let me try it again. You can always tell people who get up from, a, from, from failing mm -hmm. are usually the people who have, have this healthy ground of like self-love, this mother principle. Once you have the mother principle, the Kali principle, you can reach for the father principle. It's not wrong. The father principle is the one that makes you a little uncomfortable. 
It's like it, it, it challenges you to go a little past of what you think you can do. Yeah. It makes you shake in your boots. Yeah. But it can only be there if you have underneath a healthy sense of confidence and self-love. Then you can be a little insecure and you can leap into these unknown places. So it's like the South and the North Pole. They both have to be functioning for the person to develop. Totally get that. Yeah. yeah. So how does that then apply for somebody in their yoga practice where there has been this perhaps over masculinization yes. or in teaching for yes. centuries really? Yes, centuries, uh, centuries both centuries. east and west. Thank you very much. So how does that then, how do we as yoga practitioners, as yoga teachers bring that awareness into our our daily practice? We have to talk about it, which is why I talk about it in class a lot. You know, some people don't like that and I'm like well go find another teacher this is my message I have to say it because otherwise we fall into the same we're all you know it's not like I'm I don't have to fight it like I we all have patriarchy internalized Absolutely. so we have to fight it like I all I still have moments where I'm like I'm not good enough or you know I come into a, a room full of like smart that's my nemesis smart males intellectual males all of a sudden I start stuttering <laughs> I can't form a decent word because I'm dyslexic all of a sudden I can't say anything form a straight thought because part of me gets intimidated oh my god these are just smart people and even though I know now I have a different kind of smartness I'm actually very smart but I have an emotional intelligence I can read the room I can often heal people the smart people often need me they become like followers because they know they need that they need that sense of being held so it's you know we we do it in in small ways by encouraging our women by woman power that's why I will always like when I meet some people you, I will always address the woman first because it's like I want the women to feel beautiful and respected and comfortable because so often it's the other way around you know, we go immediately to the male and say, oh, hi, you know, you're interesting. No, I always go to the woman first because the men, they get enough attention as <laughs> already, in my opinion. But the female, they're all like, oh my God, like all those young women that I have that I'm training, because they're so beautiful. I look at them, I'm like, oh my God, you're perfect. Like, you're just beautiful. And they're like, oh, but you know, my breasts are not big enough. And oh, and you know, this and that. And it's like, no. So we need to, especially other women, we need to empower other women. We need to help them to feel like, no, you, and I want you to trust. Because it's like the Dalai Lama said, if the world still has a chance to be saved, it's going to be the Western woman. So it's like, we got to do it now gives me chills. This is why I'm here. This is my message. It's like we got to turn this around before we've destroyed everything that actually we live on. It's stupid, you know. I'm really passionate about this. Oh, I am. This morning in class you read a poem, a Hopi poem. Yes. Um, just beautiful, really, really beautiful. And so that spoke again to your passion for this way of integrated living. Yes. With the mother. Yes, yes. And an awareness of everything. Yes. Can you just speak to that Yes. Well, you know, for me that's after a long journey of classical yoga, I, I really tried to do the enlightenment like the donkey with the carrot, you know. And then I was like, well, where am I going? You know, what am I doing? And I had the good grace of meeting my teacher Jack Cornfield and that started the process of like, wait a minute, you know, Jack says that there technically there is no state of enlightenment. There is just enlightened moments. There's no enlightened retirement. <laughs> there are at best enlightened moments. So for me, it's a practice and I fail on a regular basis. But I notice, you know, like, oh, wow, I could have done that better. Let me try that again tomorrow. You know, it's, and so it's like it's an ongoing process and I want to share that so that people, we can live with more integrity and, you know, I watch here, I love Bali and it's beautiful with all the, you know, the deity, but for me, my deity is the earth. Mm -hmm. That's my highest god, goddess. She, the Pachamama, it's like this is our place and all of her creatures I worship. You know, I don't need any, I don't really need statues to worship anymore. It's like, I'd rather go feed a dog. I actually, I'm buying um, dog food so that if I come across these dogs and every time I feed a dog, I think it's, you know, God. I feed dog. So, I don't know, this is, yeah. And it, it obviously ex 
extends way past the yoga. Yoga is for me just a way of keeping my body so that my body can get me to places where I can do, you know, what I do, which is take care of people and, and animals and whatever. Simple, it's really not very complicated at all. I don't have any big concepts. It's just simple stuff. You talked about training. Do you have your own training? Yes. Yeah, I have a training course in uh, in uh, Switzerland now that I do for 200 hours and I have people from all over Europe come in for uh, five weekends one year and five weekends the next. I do it on purpose uh, over two years because I don't want fast track yogi teacher, yoga teachers. I want people who engage with the method, with the tools of yoga and dharma and learn the correct alignment because it takes a little bit. You don't learn this in a day. So what would you call your method? You yoga and dharma. Yoga and dharma. So yeah. that's quite unique again. That's your unique Yeah, that's my synthesis. unique thing. Yoga and dharma. And what feeds into this synthesis? So the training, if I were come to take this training with you? Yes. So on one hand, you're learning the tools of the uh, dharma according to Jack Cornfield. So what is dharma? How do you find your own dharma? What does that mean? Does dharma that mean? means, yep. Dharma means the, the path, the way. Sometimes they also say the Dharma is good in the, in the beginning, in the middle and in the end. The Dharma is the way. It's also sometimes translated as the law. It's the law. And uh, when you're on your Dharma, it means that you're on your path with heart. You're not up here. You're actually listening deeply to an internal calling. So a lot of people are confused. They, they mix up Dharma with bliss, like a new age philosophy. Just follow your bliss. It has nothing to do with that. Dharma can be quite hard sometimes, yeah. but you know it's worth it. At the end of the day, you go to bed and you're like, wow, I'm exhausted. I taught, you know, not here. I didn't have that many people in class, but, you know, other class, 300 people or 400 people, I teach them eight hours a day and I go to bed. I'm like, wow, I worked hard today and it feels good. I did my Dharma. So it feels right, not necessarily easy, but right. So that's what you're learning, what your Dharma is and how to deal. and it, the tools that go with it, which is mindfulness, inside meditation, which is the Brahma Viharas, which is uh, the loving kindness, how to develop. So that's on one hand. On the other hand, you get the tool of yoga, especially Anusara yoga, how to align your body. There are five principles, there are seven loops. There's a lot of therapeutic, how you cure your shoulders, how you align your neck. So like very systematic, how to, to do the poses right. So you go through every part of the body learning how that knee needs to be or how that hip needs to be you had a few glimpses this morning we just did you know a little fraction but it can make a difference between a pose hurting or a pose not hurting so it's worth it to learn it yeah so what distinguishes anusara yoga from other forms for any you know for somebody who doesn't know anything right anusara yoga just means that it, it was a uh, it was, it's kind of like it came out of the anger yoga although it's not anger yoga it's hard oriented, but it has a specific system. It just has a, it's like a map. It's like there is, there's these things to be done in every pose for the pose to be healthy. So it's, it's, it's a beautiful scientific method that is based on actual reality, like not, you know, wishful thinking, but it's like, this is how the body works, that the knee is a hinge joint, not a ball and socket joint. Let's treat it accordingly. And is this is what you talk about in your book. What's the title of your book? The uh, Art of Awakening. Okay. <laughs> I'm very proud of it. It just came out, The Art of Awakening, and uh, it's Yoga and Dharma with Kachyananda. And um, that's, it's basically my method. And there's lots of stories, you know, personal stories, which people tell me that differentiates the book from others. Because it's not just like the reaching, for the goal but it's also the explanation of the journey okay so this is common for all of us like we all have that not enough syndrome now how are we going to go and healing that together basically so i share freely from my own traumas my own wounds and then explain how you can use the dharma to get over it to heal it to move on and to even make make it into an asset so what is it that called you to take up yoga in the first place because I was very sick as a child, physically, uh -huh. like really sick. Like I, I had a mysterious liver illness that made me throw up a lot. So until I was seven, I was very sick. And so then I felt very weak physically. 
and incapable of doing many things. I often couldn't go with the school or my brothers to do things. And so when I came to yoga, I was like, well, this is the connection. I became a dancer first, but dancing was very rough and it was very competitive and it was missing that link to, to the spiritual. So when I, when I met yoga, when I was 18, I was like, oh my God, that's what I've been looking for. Because it's that link between healing the physical body and the spirit, spiritual, like the spiritual in the body. I was like, this is it. And if you were to summarize your whole journey from the beginning to now, what would you say? How would you encapsulate this journey that you've taken with your yoga practice since that very first moment? I don't know, it's a journey of grace. I, I don't really have much summarizing. It's like, it's just been just amazing. Like listening to the heart, you know, I had to like dive into trust. It's called Shraddha. In Sanskrit, it's called verified faith, which means that you risk something even though your head tells you, well, that's crazy, you know? Because I moved from Switzerland to Brazil and then from Brazil to America and then, you know, different places in America. Every time I did that, I had to reinvent myself. I had to trust again, turn over a new leaf. And it required that like that verified faith. It's like, okay, I'm just going to do it and trust that I'm going to be held. So it is a journey of grace, the whole thing. And just giving the opportunity, if you had one message that you would like to communicate with the world, what would your message be? Wow, that's a big one. <laughs> well, I know you've got one. <laughs> Stop being stupid. <laughs> Seriously. Sometimes I'm like, I know we're supposed to be the crown of creation, but I really look out and I just don't think so. It's like, well, I just really, really wish that we would wake up and see our, the actions that we're doing have consequences, not just for us, but for all the other beings and eventually for us too. It's like we can't poison, you know, people eat fish now and that are, have bellies full of plastic. So it's like not good for the people either. So may we stop and turn around. That's my message and my hope and my passion, what I'm working on. It's like that we stop, you know, that we see this beautiful world and what it is, not like some punishing camp, but actually as an incredibly divine expression of beauty and, and, and it is the divine. So that's my message. Thank you so much, Katya Nanda, for your inspiring message, your passion and your wisdom. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the festival. You're welcome. And thank you so much for watching. Join me again here at the Bali Spirit Festival with me, Shakti Sundari, on Heart to Heart.